All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Top Level Sports Podcast. I'm your host, Connor Grohl, as always. It's been a little while since we've done one of these, but today we're going to be talking about the NBA playoffs, recapping the action so far, and looking ahead to the conference finals. I'm here with a couple of my good friends who have been on the show before. We have Michael Lyon. Hey, what's up, Connor? And we have Rich Butnagar. Hey, Connor. And we're going to start off by talking about the Game 7s. Had two great Game 7s Sunday, yesterday for us. In the first game, Portland beat Denver to move on to the conference finals, 196. And afterwards, the Raptors beat the 76ers, 92-90. I think we'll just go in the order of the games and start off with the Blazers advancing to their first conference finals in this Damian Lillard, CJ McCollum era. What would you guys think of the game? Yeah, so CJ McCollum showed up, and Damian Lillard only scoring 13 points, but making some big shots late uh, showed what it's really like to be a superstar when the shots aren't falling to defer to CJ, who balled out and played a heck of a game. Yeah, I mean, I can't really tack on too much other than, wow, the Nuggets missed a lot of threes at the end of that game. Uh, they, I think they missed their last 15 threes yeah, in a yeah. row. The Nuggets only shot two of 19 from the three-point line in the... Game 7, and three-point shooting was really rough just for all four teams playing in Game 7s, and we're going to talk about that a little bit later. Uh, but it was a strong start for Denver, uh, and I think that's kind of what you would expect. It's really hard to win a Game 7 on the road, uh, but Portland was able to do just that. The Nuggets had a 17-point lead uh, early in the second quarter, uh, but yeah, in the second half, it was just kind of C.J. McCollum taking over. It was the C.J. McCollum game. Uh, he had 37 points and 9 rebounds, and like you were saying, uh, CJ McCollum was the guy in clutch time, hitting a lot of shots, uh, incredible mid-range game, something you don't see a lot in the modern NBA, but he was on fire, and Damian Lillard was actually deferring to him and letting CJ kind of run the show. And the confidence for CJ to tell the coach, like, I'm scoring right now, I can score for our team, give me the ball, and the... Um, the resolve of Damian Lillard to, to give him the ball, you know, I think it says a lot about him and his will to, to want to make his team win. Yeah, and I'm just looking at the Nuggets stat line here, and I mean, Jamal Murray and Paul Mills have a terrible game. It's 4 for 18, 0 for 4 from 3 from Murray, and 3 for 13, 0 of 2 from 3 from Millsap. And those are games that you just cannot have on any game 7. Uh, Nikola Jokic went shot 26 times, 11 of 26, but only had two assists, which is really interesting yeah. because, because Jokic is generally the primary passer on that team. Yeah, he's a big triple-double threat always, and Jokic, again, his offensive game, it was decent, but it wasn't uh, very efficient, and I think when Jokic really shines is when it really starts for him as being that primary ball handler or, uh, and just kind of running the offense, whether that be with the passes or the screens. And other people weren't taking shots. And I think Jokic benefits a lot from when other people are making shots. So, they, so other teams you know, kind of have to close down on the shooters and then give him more space to operate in those uh, post kind of situations and on the drives. Because we saw a lot of the times when he just was able to, well, the Blazers were able to defend him very successfully with double teams in the post. And when, other team, when his teammates couldn't really get it going, uh, it makes it a lot difficult for Jokic too. I think ultimately the Nuggets were just not ready to make a deep playoff run. They're not experienced enough. Uh, Jamal Murray was inconsistent for the majority of the playoffs. And uh, they're not, I just think they weren't talented enough. They don't have enough top heavy talent. And maybe they have a good young core. Maybe they can develop some of that later. But right now they're not ready uh, to make the conference finals or the finals. I, mean, I definitely do think they have the good young core. And I think Denver is a team. We expected them to make the playoffs this year, but I don't think any of us expected them to be the two seed. I think we were thinking probably in like that four or five range at best. And it, it's worth kind of saying that the, and the Western Conference is only separated by a few games anyways, but they were kind of just battling with the Warriors for the one seed the whole season long. Um, so they're kind of, maybe in a year or two, uh, will be able to use this experience. They played in two game sevens, two seven game series in this playoffs against good teams, which I think will definitely help them down the road. Uh, but for the Blazers, this is the big step they really needed to take because I think a lot of people have been sleeping on the Blazers for a while and they've always been a playoff team, but haven't really been able to go deep. And this is their first run to the conference finals. All the more impressive considering Nurkic got hurt, right? 
Yeah, and I think Cantor has stepped up, and he was you know a little injured, and he's been able to play big minutes for them. They had got it going for some role players. Rodney Hood specifically uh, only averaged three points per game against the Thunder, but stepped it up to 15 against the Nuggets, and really led the way in that crazy quadruple overtime game three. Uh, in that fourth overtime, he came in. He was really the only player with some energy that was able to knock down shots. Um, yeah, going back to what you were saying about Enes Kanter, I think he was actually a really, really important player in this series because he forces Nurkic, or Jokic, rather, to do what he does least, essentially, defend, right? Uh, Enes Kanter is a great post player, and that forces uh, Jokic to have to defend. Yeah, and Jokic was in a little bit of foul trouble in this series, uh, so definitely the role players from the Blazers stepping up in a big way. Um, but really, I think that if we're just going to settle on one kind of major storyline, it was really the emergence of C.J. McCollum. He's a player, I think he's incredible. I think the Blazers are really right there with the Rockets and the Warriors backcourts. And C.J. McCollum's a guy, this is his fourth season now, averaging 20 points per game, has yet to make an all-star team. And with the all the star guards in the Western Conference and the emerging guards like Devin Booker. He feels like he might be one of these guys that just gets stuck and never ends up making one, and he could be one of the greatest players that never makes an all-star game uh, if he decides to stick with this Portland core and Damian Lillard in the West. But, you know, whatever... I think the important thing about Portland is none of these guys have egos. It's what you've seen with Damian Lillard and McCollum. They're willing to defer to whoever's hot, and I think these guys don't really care as much about personal accolades. They're just looking for the team performance. It's amazing. After last year, uh, everyone was saying to break them, break out McCollum and Lillard, yeah. and look at them now. Just sticking around, and now yeah. I think maybe this is a little bit early to jump into this, but I think they don't. I think they have a non-zero chance of beating the Warriors. I think a lot of people were just thinking, you know, maybe the winner of this Portland Denver series. It had the lowest viewership of all the four conference semifinal series. I think a lot of people just assume that, you know, it doesn't matter. They'll just lose to the Warriors anyway. But with this Kevin Durant injury, and I, th I think the Blazers are more than capable of making things a little difficult for the champs. Well, the low viewership is too bad because it was a heck of a series, uh, especially that four overtime game. Both teams kind of poured their heart and souls into it, and you could tell. Uh, but yeah, it, it might be, we're going to talk about it later, but uh, without Kevin Durant playing in the, in the next series, um, it's going to be kind of uh, Lillard and McCollum versus Curry and Thompson. Uh, so can they meet up to the challenge of the Splash Brothers? They're going to have their shot. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I think that basically wraps us up on Portland-Denver. Uh, but moving on, though, we have the Raptors and the Sixers in that other Game 7 game. Again, 92-90, the final score there. It was a really ugly start. It was just 18-13, the lead for the Raptors at the end of the first quarter. But then the Sixers had a strong third quarter, and they took back the lead. Eventually, it came down the last few minutes, and Kawhi Leonard hitting a huge game winner. Bounced four times on the rim, but they'll take it any way they can get it. Yeah, straight to the point. What a shot from Kawhi Leonard at the end of the game. Uh, he wanted it. He was aggressive the whole game, and credit to him for that. Um, his shot wasn't falling at times, especially in the beginning, but he had a great fourth quarter. He stuck with it, and uh, he showed us why he's uh, one of the best players in the league and one of the most clutch players in the league. Yeah, I mean, the shot by Kawhi was great. Albeit quite lucky in my opinion. Uh, I'm pretty sure you could shoot that shot another hundred times and not make that shot. I think that was insane. But to Michael's credit, he was extremely aggressive and all, even though the shot wasn't falling, he continued to take shots and that's all you can really ask for from your superstar. Now switching to Philly, I think, uh, I think Philly's got to be asking, some, asking themselves a lot of questions, particularly about how they use Ben Simmons in the clutch. Ben Simmons only took five shots this game. Like that's, that's not acceptable under any circumstance for a person that made an all-star team this year for the first time. So here's the tricky thing about Ben Simmons to me is Ben Simmons is a great player and I think no one's going to deny that fact. But Ben Simmons is not a guy that can lead your team late in a game. He's too much of a liability. He can't hit the big shot. He can't hit the three. You know, he can hardly hit a free throw. So when you have a guy that's offense is basically you know, just limited to trying to get easy looks around the basket. He's more of a passer, but in these late game situations, they're going to force Ben Simmons to shoot the ball. And when that happens, 
the ball really can't be in Ben Simmons' hands. So what you saw in the end of that game was the primary ball handler was Jimmy Butler. They tried to get Embiid some looks. They really couldn't get, get him anything good in the post area either. They really struggled as an offense, despite all of their star players, to generate any good looks at all. Yeah, you know, speaking of not being able to shoot threes, what in the world is Joel Embiid doing going one for six from the three-point line? Uh, in the big games like this, uh, he, he needs to be going in the post. He really That's shouldn't be game. shooting many threes to begin with. I think he gets right. baited into a lot of them. Right, right. And I mean, his game, where he's strong, why he's an all-star, is not because he can shoot threes. It's because he's really good in the post. And he had the opportunity to do that. He didn't. He was hanging around the three-point line. A lot of that is a problem with Philly's offense in general, as uh, Ben Simmons uh, can't space the floor, so it can kind of get crowded, and uh, Embiid would want to give Simmons the room to drive. And it kind of when you have that dynamic, it kind of limits Tobias Harris to being a catch and shoot three point shooter when he's capable of more than that. Um, it gets good for Reddick's role, but Philly has a lot of problems that they're going to have to deal with this offseason because Butler might be out of there too, and uh, he was really their best player in this series in this playoffs. Yeah, the, those plays, those play calling at the end of that game were honestly terrible. Like, one of the plays was literally Ben Simmons driving into two players and trying to feed the ball to Redick for an open three-pointer at the end of a game. That's not, that's, that's, that's a completely wrong play call. I don't think that should ever happen. And I think Brett Brown needs to really take a long look at himself and think about what exactly he's going to do with this roster late in games. Because I think this is starting to show a little bit of an, a lack of attention to detail late in games because Ben, uh, it's always Brett Brown's team, it seems. Right? There's probably last, gonna... last year during the Celtics season series as well. A lot of those games came down to the clutch, and they just didn't execute. Well, there's probably going to be some changes either with the roster or Philadelphia management might want to look at Brett Brown. You know, how, why hasn't he been able to manage uh, one of the top, one of the best, if not the best, starting five in the NBA? Yeah, I think we definitely say they're the best starting five in the East, at least on paper. It doesn't you know turn out that way when you actually look at it? And I think it's yeah, they're not able to utilize. Joel Embiid as effectively as they can. They've really limited the role of Tobias Harris. Again, he was basically leading that Clippers team before he was traded to Philly. Uh, but when you look at this game, I think you got to give a lot of credit to the Raptors. The Sixers actually shot better in this game from the field, which is very rare to see, especially like in the game seven, the team that shoots worst to actually lose the game. But the or the team that shoots better to lose the game, rather. The Sixers shot 43%, and Toronto shot 38%. But Toronto outshot, just in straight-up field goal attempts, the 76ers 89-65. to 65, Wow. Which is pretty ridiculous. They had 11 more offensive rebounds, five fewer turnovers. Again, the Sixers with all the shot clock violations and turnovers late in the game. And then the Raptors... We were able to get some good minutes from Serge Ibaka, who had had a pretty bad series, especially defensively, but he had 17 points, 8 rebounds, hit a bunch of threes off the bench. So they were able to, you know, the shots necessarily weren't falling for them. Again, Kawhi Leonard took 39 shots, so he was just kind of, nothing else was really dropping, so he was just kind of kept trying to take the initiative. But they were able to do the other things that were able to help them win that game. Yeah, I mean, it's very odd to see all five of the Sixers starting five go positive in the plus-minus and lose. Just the, the three reserves players they played, Ennis, uh, Scott, and Monroe, went, went negative eight, negative 12, and minus nine. And Joel Embiid was plus, and again, we say that Joel Embiid didn't have a great game, and he really didn't, but his impact is still shown by the fact that he went plus 10 in 45 minutes, which if you're doing the math means the Sixers lost by 12 in the three minutes he was off the floor. So where do the Sixers go from here? Yeah, it's a good question. Again, we have this starting five, probably the best in the East. Ben Simmons, J.J. Redick, Tobias Harris, Jimmy Butler, and uh, Joel Embiid. Redick is going to be a free agent. I think Redick has still done great in his role again. He's now going to be 35. So I think they can try to keep stringing him along on these kind of one- or two-year deals and just make it a little cheaper. Uh, but I think the... The bigger considerations are Jimmy Butler, who has a player option, and Tobias Harris, who is going to be a free agent, potentially seeking a max deal despite the fact that based on his Sixers performance, he kind of got lost, so I don't really think he's much of a max player. 
Yeah, he's not going to be worth the max to Philadelphia. I mean, if you just look at the way they used him this year and during the playoffs, uh, that's not a max level contribution. Uh, I think they might want to look at, uh, I don't think Jimmy Butler is going to want to come back. I've heard rumors about Jimmy Butler going to Los Angeles, join LeBron and the Lakers, and nobody knows exactly what he's going to want to do, but uh, I don't know why he would want to stay in Philadelphia, uh, all things yeah. considered. And Jimmy Butler and Tobias Harris fill, fulfill pretty similar roles, so I feel like we're not going to see both of them back. I think it's basically a done deal that this starting five will probably not return, just because, a, for money reasons, I don't think the Sixers can pull it off. Uh, and B, just because, again, we've seen some of these personalities not mesh. I'm kind of wondering, it, it looks like Jimmy Butler and Embiid have kind of grown this friendship. I'm kind of wondering if the Sixers think about dealing Ben Simmons and seeing what they can get for them. Again, because of some of these inabilities late game for him to really contribute. Because you can't really have your primary ball handler, a guy that you can't have the ball in his hands late in the game seven. Yeah, I agree completely. I think uh, I think the Sixers should look at Joel Embiid and Ben Simmons personally. I think Jimmy Butler and Tobias Harris are great in their roles, and I think the Sixers should try and keep both of them. But in terms of Joel Embiid and Ben Simmons, their styles clash with each other almost directly because Ben Simmons can't shoot, so he needs to go. He needs to drive into the lane and post up to get all his points. But that's where Joel Embiid stays, and therefore limits the spacing, clog, clogs everything up in the paint. I think they have to do something about that, and I think personally they should trade away Ben Simmons because Joel Embiid, in my opinion, has a has a far a higher upside than uh, Ben Simmons in the long run, and Ben Simmons hasn't shown the ability thus far to get any better at shooting, so who knows if he will. Right, well, if the starting five is not going to come back, uh, Connor said it's all but a foregone conclusion that they will not, uh, then, I mean, if one of them just walks, if Tobias Harris and or Butler just walk in free agency, I mean, that's not even a team that's talented enough to make a run in the Eastern Conference. So they're going to want to look at a trade, I would imagine, uh, if they can try to get both of those players back. And then what, like trade Simmons or something they could look at is maybe Embiid for Anthony Davis in a, in a larger kind of franchise-altering trade. Oh, trade. Um, <laughs> oh, that's interesting. I never, they, I never thought of that, actually. They've been willing to make the splash, uh, as they've shown. They, they acquired Jimmy Butler, they acquired Tobias Harris, so they're, kind of, they're willing to mix things up. I don't know if they'd be willing to go all the way as trade their cornerstone piece, Joel Embiid, that's so like, connected with the fans and uh, that type of thing, and proven that he's an all-star caliber player, but um, Anthony Davis is better, <laughs> you know, and he's more established, and uh, surrounding him with that type of talent... Uh, they'd probably have to give up more than just Embiid, maybe depending on what the rest of what other teams are going to be offering for Anthony Davis. More than just Embiid for Anthony Davis, really? I think. Well, yeah, I, considering Embiid's injury history, I, I can't yeah, imagine. That's what I, I was going to bring up. I also think Joel Embiid is a guy that, again, he's been in the NBA for five years. He played in 31 games, you know, in that third season he missed the first two, but he still has yet to play in more than 64 games in a season. So with all these injury risks, it doesn't really matter if you're the best center in the league, which, I mean, he's at least in the conversation. Uh, but if you're not on the floor, how much can you really do? So it, he, he has really a troubling future. Right. And in this series, even, he only really showed up for one game in game three. And he was saying, like, he, he's sick or whatever. He's, like, woke up at 6 a.m. one of the times texting coach, like, I haven't slept. I don't know if I'm going to play. I, I mean, given just that combined with, like, the long history of injuries, uh, his reliability is a major question. So, yeah, I think it would probably take more than him uh, to get Davis. Uh, I mean, I don't know exactly what else they would have to offer. They've given up a lot of their assets to get Jimmy Butler and Tobias Harris, and their bench is kind of thin. Uh, but that might be something that they would just want to consider if, uh, if they want to move in the right direction. It, it feels weird because this is such like a strong team. But also, again, it's, it's difficult to find a way to, for them to move forward, for them to really stay as competitive as they are now. And I'm not really sure what the best option is. I, you know, despite whatever you say about you know, character concerns or something. I still really like Jimmy Butler because at least you know with Jimmy Butler, like this dude wants to win, right? 
So you have a guy that can be that kind of leader and just, you know, try to guide his team forward and with the passion. So I really like Jimmy Butler. Uh, but again, if you're trying to get rid of Ben Simmons, then he still, Jimmy Butler is not going to be your point guard. So it, 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 there are a lot of difficult things the Sixers are going to have to figure out this offseason. Sure, it's going to be tough for Elton Brand and the Sixers staff to figure it out. But I think, I think we're getting a little off topic. We should move back a little to the Raptors about uh, like their, their decision, of course, in the big offseason to move DeMar DeRozan for, Ka- or for Kawhi, which we initially thought was going to be a one a one season rental, but any, any changes on that front? I could easily see him re-signing with the Raptors, especially if they, make, if they win their next series against Milwaukee. Uh, even from the beginning, I don't think, because uh, that was around the time that Paul George was re-signing with the Thunder. I think it kind of changed a lot of people's minds in terms of like, uh, like he might re-sign with the Raptors, right? It's not a guarantee, but it's a risk that uh, it's been proven that teams can change a player's mind over the course of a year. I think he's developed somewhat of a connection with the fans. And this is why they brought him to Toronto. That when he hit that game-winning shot, uh, you know, lucky or not, uh, he got off a good look uh, over Joel Embiid. He's guarded by Ben Simmons, two like, really good defenders. Uh, that's the type of thing that DeMar DeRozan was never able to do for them in the big moments. And uh, Kawhi's a proven finals MVP uh, that stepped up to the challenge and made that big shot. That's why they brought him there. The fans love it. Uh, Kawhi's got to love it. Uh, it doesn't show much emotion, but he was pretty <laughs> happy after that win. Uh, so, yeah, I think uh, really good for Toronto, and they might keep him if, if Toronto can make some more yeah. progress. I think if you're Kawhi Leonard, and again, that's a good point you're bringing up with Paul George, because I don't think anyone thought Paul George was going to resign with the Thunder. Uh, and, and then Paul George had a breakout season, and the Thunder didn't really get much better. But uh, <laughs> well, well, I think that's because of his injury. But Yeah, um, but yeah, with Kawhi Leonard, I think my money would be on Kawhi Leonard resigning. Because I think if you're Kawhi Leonard and you look at things, and again, it, it doesn't look like the Sixers are going to get obviously better, and it doesn't look like the Celtics are going to get obviously better. So I think if you're Kawhi Leonard and the Bucks don't necessarily have the most talented roster, they have Giannis. But if you're looking at the Bucks as being you know, the only major threat to you in the East, I think you kind of take that. I think that puts you in a great position. Right, with some good young players behind you, Pascal Siakam, Fred Van Vliet. You know, they've got a, a talented, deep roster to work with. Uh, the, the only better situation, I mean, if he wants to team up with Kevin Durant at the Clippers or, or something like that, but... Uh, you know, that's not as far from a guarantee. His original thought was the Lakers, but I can't imagine anybody wanting to join the Lakers right now. And so, yeah, I, I like Toronto's odds to keep them, especially if they uh, win the next series. Yeah. Um, switching things up a little bit, we've been talking about the conference semifinals and those game sevens. But, there, you know, there are 16 teams that have made the playoffs, so we've had a lot of juicy playoff action uh, so far that has led us to these conference finals. And, you know, I think we're, we can be somewhat unbiased about the, conference, or about the conference finals moving forward because all of our main teams are kind of out of it. I know, Michael, you're a Celtics slash Thunder fan, and Rich, you like the Rockets. And I was rooting for the Rockets as well, and also at the same time kind of joining that Nuggets bandwagon towards the end of the season. Uh, but going back to that, first I guess we'll go back to the uh, Golden State Warriors-Rockets series which I know it's kind of going to be frustrating for us to talk about, but I do want us to talk about because the Rockets, this was their opportunity to kind of get the reverse of last season. We had, again, I think these two teams are very equally matched, but what we saw last season was the Rockets take a 3-2 lead and then lose Chris Paul and blow it. And now this season, the reverse was kind of true. The, the, um, the Warriors had a 3-2 lead and then lost Kevin Durant, but the Warriors were able to, even without one of their stars, close things out, something the Rockets couldn't do last year. Right. Well, just to clarify first, I like the roster the Thunder put together, but I'm a number one Celtics and only Celtics fan, uh, first and foremost. Uh, and <laughs> moving on, yeah, yeah, it was a very, very, very disappointing series for the Rockets. I mean, this is one of the most crushing things. I know you guys are Rockets fans, but the last losing to the Warriors in the playoffs four out of the last five years, to lose on your home floor in game six when the opposing team doesn't have their best player. Yeah, this is one of the most devastating things a franchise 
has ever gone through and could ever go, go through. Uh, I mean, it's just devastating. They put all of their focus into beating Golden State throughout the whole year. I mean, Clint Capella was joking about how they wanted that matchup with the Warriors when they were playing the Clippers. The Clippers would be an easier win. Oh, man. Uh, but, yeah, no, this... Uh, I can't imagine the pain and frustration. They got so close. All of the games were close, all series. Yeah. But um, they couldn't get it done in the end. And, you know... Six straight two-possession games. And it's really, it, it's so difficult because these two teams are really close. The Rockets won three out of four in the regular season. And if you go back to the last two years playoffs and regular seasons, these teams are basically 50-50. And it just seems like the Warriors have a little more in the playoffs. Uh, again, they've lost Rockets now four years and five to the Warriors. It's really difficult. Um, and I think the Rockets may have been the four seed. But again, I think you're, we're kind of kidding ourselves if, we don't think that this was basically the Western Conference Finals in terms of just team quality. The Rockets posed the biggest threat to the Warriors, I think, of anyone in the West. Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest issues I had personally as a Rockets fan with the series was the way Clint Capella and Chris Paul played. Uh, we'll start with the obvious Clint Capella. He was a liability during the first two games. I think he regressed as a player immensely. First, uh, during the offseason last year, I had extreme reservations about paying him $90 million just as pretty much a dunker and a pick-and-roll pick player, and I guess kind of a rim presence, but he was, he was, he was actually good last year as a rim presence. But this, this year, he's really regressed defensively as a, rim pre, as a rim presence, as well as a perimeter defender. Last year during the conference finals, Clint Capella could, have, could actually hold his own a little bit on the perimeter against Stephen Clay. This and KD, somewhat. This, this series, it was all about how bad Kevin Durant was exploiting that matchup for the first five series, for the first five games in the series. And then for the last game, I mean, Curry just took off, uh, just showed up where KD left off, right? Yeah, it was pretty crazy. And again, Capella, I think his regular season performance, uh, I don't know if it fully warranted all the money they were paying him, but he was definitely uh, still pretty impressive. I think some of that comes from just playing more minutes, but... Again, he can kind of he can catch all the lobs from James Harden he wants, but in the playoffs he did really struggle, uh, and that's something that's really unfortunate. Because when you look at the Warriors, the Warriors don't really have a big that can match up. I mean, if you want to talk about just pure height, Kevin Durant, but position wise, Clint Capella should be having a field day with Kevon Looney and Andrew Bogut, right? Uh, but at the same time. Yeah, it's just, it's, it's really difficult. I think Chris Paul had a really good game six performance. He was definitely pretty good towards the end of that series. I mean, it's just, it's, it's, I think the rebounding was one of the bigger stories. I think off on the offensive glass, the Warriors, they had guys like Draymond and Looney, who I think had a great series, uh, and Iguodala were able to provide the Warriors extra possessions because I don't necessarily think the Rockets offense was much worse than the Warriors. I don't think either offense was great in this series by any means, but I think the Warriors just kind of gave themselves more shots at it when it mattered. Yeah, you know, it's fair to say that Capella did not play well and that uh, CP3 did not play well outside of Game 6. He had a tremendous Game 6. Uh, but where does a lot of the blame fall? I, I like it or not, you know, despite having numbers that are comparable to his regular season numbers, you know, where's James Harden when he's turning the ball over uh, in a close game, late uh, game one, and then missing the game winning shot, looking for the refs to bail him out? And game six, when he turns the ball over four times in the fourth quarter, you know, these are the kind of moments that that he's kind of waiting, that people call him a choker in the playoffs. You know, these are the moments that he has to prove them wrong. And he had opportunities to prove them wrong. And at the end of the day, they run their whole offense through him. And when it's close, late, against the team you've been waiting to beat, uh, you, I think you have to play better in the last two minutes of the game. So let me pose a question, because I think after, in the aftermath of the series, again, just losing to the Warriors every time, it feels like, uh, in these playoffs... Everyone's really just been asking, is this Warriors kind of, or the Rockets' offensive strategy, this kind of, you know, three-point and free-throw focused, James Harden, primary, everything, uh, you, you know, is this strategy kind of a way that can lead, that can lead the Rockets to a championship? Because a lot of people have just been saying, 
not as much about just like maybe necessarily the player performance, but just the way this team is structured can't win a title. So I want to know what your opinions are on that. Well, I think it can win. A t- this is something that uh, Max Kellerman said that I agree with. Uh, it can lead them to a title if James Harden is clutch. And, you know, he hasn't been in the playoffs. His overall numbers this year were you know, a little below or about what they were in the regular season, which were very good numbers, by the way. Um, but, you know, if you want to beat the best team, the, the Warriors are arguably the best franchise in NBA history, you know, in those clutch moments, you're going to have to do better than what he did in the series. I mean, I just, it's, it's a tough question because on the one hand, it's honestly kind of worked. Like every game in the series wasn't a blow up by any means. Last year, they took him to seven games. So theoretically, if one of those uh, if one of those games flipped this season, then the Rockets could have won the series. But I think I'm going to have to say no because I just think, like, from a pure basketball perspective, when you just have one person doing everything on an offense and three and three people, every possession, just standing around, that does a lot, not only for, uh, like, the effort of those players because they're just standing there doing, okay, well, I guess we're just not involved in this play anymore, right? Or even when they do get the ball, they haven't – consistently beginning those shots up so they more likely to miss because they just haven't had the rhythm to shoot the ball. And I think in general, more motion is good, as evidenced by the way the Warriors play their basketball, right? But, so I would say no, but, I mean, it's, it's, it's a close, it's a close. What I, I think it's kind of unfair to blame this D'Antoni system. Uh, I'm on the side, I think the Rockets can win a championship. I think they're just... They're running, they're running into the brick wall of the Warriors, right? Where if they're playing in basically any other time in NBA history, they probably have a ring by now. It's just you're going up against, again, like the greatest team ever. We had last season, last season they should have been NBA champions. I'm not going to say, I'm not going to give the excuse and say they would have won game six and seven without Chris Paul. I don't think we can ultimately know, although it definitely would have made a big difference. But when you look at this team, in game seven, they missed 27 threes in a row, and they only lose by nine points, right? Like, they had basically the worst shooting performance you could possibly have, and they were still basically in that game till the end. And if they win that game, then again, they go up against a horrible Cavaliers team, at least for a finals team, right? And they probably win the championship. It's tough, and you're always going to blame it on the system, because, again, you have to find something to blame it on. So we go to the oh, well, all they do is shoot threes and look for fouls, and all they do is, you know, complain with the refs and this and that. But I, it's really, I think what we come down to for every team in the NBA is, like, it's just really hard to beat the Warriors. And I don't really know what the solution to that is, but I, they're, they're giving the Warriors as good, as a run, as good of a run as anybody. Right. I, I think the problem with they could have won last year, they should have won last year is... Well, give him Chris Paul, and then on top of that, take out Kevin Durant and flip the script, and you have this year's playoffs. Yeah. And we kind of see what happens. So that part of it kind of takes out the blame the system to me. I mean, I don't, and I it, it comes down to, to blame James I Harden. I think we can argue, like, as far I, I think, as... I think it's an effective system I, where if James Harden was more of a clutch player in the same way that Kobe or Kawhi have proven to be, then they would already have been NBA champions. I think champions. what we can agree is, as far as just, like, the Rockets' kind of legacy or their kind of argument goes, like, losing to a KD-less Warriors in Game 6 is basically the worst thing that could have happened to them. Right. I don't know. I don't know if I'd go out that far and say Harden is an unclutch player because, like, it's he's had plenty of clutch moments. He had clutch yeah. moments. He he had a game winner against the Warriors in the regular season. It's yeah. just the timing is weird. Yeah, I, I think I think showing I think looking at game one and saying oh he missed the the game time three point three three pointer like like I feel like I feel like it's unex uh, I feel like it's unfair to make expect that him to make that shot all the time or like make it like. Because at the end of the day, it's still a hard shot. It would always guarding him, so on and so forth. It's like, it's, I don't know if I'd go that far. I think I wouldn't put a lot of blame on this to James Harden personally because his stats were literally almost identical to that of the regular season. He was 44% in the regular season. He's 44% here. He was 36% from three. He's 35% in the series. Uh, the big difference was he averaged one less point a game because he averaged one less free throw attempt per game. I, I, think, that's, I think that's what it was. And I think he played pretty much the way he should have played throughout the series. Uh, he, I feel like he was the consistent guy getting you 35 points a game every night. 
And he was, he, through the first three games, when Kevin Durant was having an insanely amazing game, Harden was right there. He pretty much canceled out Kevin Durant, and even though Kevin Durant was having an amazing, sta- amazing game by anybody's standards. Amazing series by anybody's standards. So. Yeah, I mean, but as I said, his numbers were similar to what he put up in the regular season. I mean, it was a hard shot in game one, but it's kind of like the accumulation of the... He turned it over the possession before that. You're not going to expect him to, to make a huge, like, impossible shot or play every single time. But, I mean, at some point, you kind of have to start having some of those moments in the playoffs if you want to be considered a clutch player. And he's failed to produce that in the close games late against the Warriors and in the playoffs in general year after year after year now. And it's frustrating for the Rockets, you know, it's, it's difficult, to, but that's kind of been the case at this point, and you have to start to acknowledge that. So then I kind of want to ask a different question, because we've we talked about the Rockets shooting, again, is, is this kind of three-point-led offense something that can lead to success? And we saw the Rockets in that Game 7 last year against the Warriors, they shot 7 of 44 from the three-point line. And then if you want to compare that to the Game 7s that we saw yesterday, Portland shot 4 of 26, 15%. Denver shot 2 of 19, 10%. Toronto, 7 of 30, 23%. The Sixers were the only team that shot, you know, a decent mark at 9 of 27 for 33%. But when you have four teams shoot 21% from three-pointers in Game 7, and then if you want to add in the Rockets last year, that's basically five great teams that all of them, they really struggle heavily from three-point shooting. Is this just a few games, or is there something that we can say for maybe it's more valuable to take mid-range shots or try to get closer to the basket in a game seven versus in, versus you know in a normal game? Is three-point shooting a less effective strategy in clutch games? Well, I think I think for the Rockets specifically, I think no, because that's all they've been doing all year, right? They only shoot threes or layups. So maybe you could argue maybe they should shoot less threes and more layups, but I think since threes are such an integral part of their offense, I think they should leave it at that. I don't think the game plan is ever just shoot more layups. It's hard to generate layups, yeah, right? But or, <laughs> no, or, or, or maybe or maybe just tell Harden instead of shooting eleven threes a game, shoot like seven and drive more and kick, right? Yeah. But that's but that, like the point I'm trying to make is like for the Rockets, it's not really that's not that's not really an option, right? But for the other teams, I think what I think in the advent of the three-point shooting revolution with where every team shoots more threes because it's a more efficient thing to do. There's a lot of inherent variance in the way people shoot a lot of threes, and it's most evidence of the way the Rockets play, right? Either they have great games where they make 27 threes in a game, or they have terrible games like the Game 7 last year. <clears throat> now, that variance isn't for all other 29 teams, but it is there. And I think where, get, where, where Game 7s are concerned, everybody's a little nervous, the defense is a lot tighter. And so I think that that has an overall negative effect on the way uh, teams shoot threes. So, in conclusion, I would say that game sevens three point shooting is going to be lower than the average. I think that's. I think. I think it's just going to be. I mean, there's probably something to be said for uh, maybe the nerves of, of a game seven to kind of get to worse three point shooting on average. But if you're a team that says live by the three and die by the three, uh, I mean fear of game sevens I don't think should be something that deters you from that strategy. Uh, I wouldn't say it's like concrete enough of a, I mean, they're the same shots you've been shooting all year if you have enough trust in your system. Uh, and I think the, the Rockets problem is not that they, I mean, they lost in six games this year. Right? Their three point shooting in game sevens in general is not even though it's not a factor in something that's doomed to their series. Um, they did a horrible, or their, their franchise in the last, um, you know, five, the Harden era. Uh, they, did, they had a horrible game seven last year in terms of shooting the three, but uh, I, that can be something that can probably be isolated into that game, considering, I mean, it was worse than, than game sevens in, in general for NBA teams. Yeah, I, I think I have to agree with you just kind of on the sentiment of, I think if you're a three-point shooting team, I mean, if you just continue shoot, shooting three-pointers, uh, I, I don't think it makes a ton of sense to just kind of, kind of try to deviate from your strategy just for a game seven. But I, I think I will pose maybe another explanation, is maybe when, you, when you're when you in these playoff series, especially, yeah, just like in the playoffs and you get to a game seven, your star players are kind of shooting or playing like 40-plus minutes every game. So I think 
in game seven, you might have kind of like a fatigue factor where guys are a little more tired and they're kind of more willing to kind of just settle for threes. And I think that might mm -hmm. play into it a little bit. So I kind of need to hear if you have any thoughts on that. Right. Uh, that's, I think that's a pretty big reason. I mean, in game, not only have, has, have the star players been playing 40 plus minutes all series, but uh, I mean, people kind of go more, way more heavy. Coaches lean heavy on the starting five in game sevens. Uh, I feel like the, there's teams only playing seven guys, and the two guys that come off the bench play between 10 and 15 and again, minutes. Like we were so. saying, like, we've had guys play 45 minutes a game. It's yeah, uh, yeah, Toronto only played seven guys in that game yeah, seven. Yeah. yeah, so that could help explain the, the poor decision-making or maybe the fatigue leads to them shooting a lower percentage. But uh, if you also yeah. look at their overall field goal percentage also lowered a little bit uh, compared to what they've been doing for the rest of the season and the rest of the series. So I think fatigue uh, is one of the more... One of the factors that could uh, contribute to that, and uh, that's not a reason to switch up the strategy you've had all year. Yeah, I think in the case of like Denver, uh, Denver also shoots a ton of threes a game. Uh, Portland, I mean, Damian Lillard's been well uh, documented as shooting some of the craziest three point shots ever. <laughs> yeah. How about, sure. that? How about, how about I mean, that? How about that game against Thunder, right? Oh my gosh. Yeah. So, I mean, I think with those types of teams that shoot a lot of threes, I think you just sort of have to do it. Um, whether you whether you want to or not, I think CJ McCollum definitely changed, flipped the script in that game seven with the way with the amount of mid range shots he actually took, which is actually insane. Uh, but I think I think if three point shooting is what you do and what your role players are brought here to do, you should do that. Yeah, I'm just you know I'm just excited that we got to see these two game sevens because we did see two incredible matchups. Uh, it was really fun to check out one team that did not get to experience a Game 7 uh, was the Boston Celtics. <laughs> Had a strong Game 1 in Milwaukee, after which Paul Pierce declared the Bucks dead. <laughs> uh, however, four straight wins for the Bucks sends the Celtics packing, sell, or, uh, sends Kyrie Irving into a very uncertain future with the Celtics. Uh, resident Celtics fan, how do you feel about this team's performance this season? and? What 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 do you think is going to be the solution moving forward with or without Kyrie Irving? Quickly before that, just to pile on, the Celtics are the first team in NBA history to win their first five games and then lose their next four. Nice. Yeah, well, <laughs> what a failure of a season, really. I mean, I think what we did in the playoffs kind of uh, is a representative of what our season was like. Uh, we won five games in a row just to spur up a little bit of hope that we might do something, and then ultimately our inconsistency and um, poor team chemistry yeah. Don't you think uh, dumps our season going down the into the season? The Celtics were probably the favorites in the Eastern Conference. Yeah, they were the hands down favorite. Yeah. I mean, you had like Colin Coward and other people predicting that they would beat the Warriors. You know, forget about the East. They were kind of the the spicy pick to, yeah. to upset the Warriors in the beginning of the season. And all that's down the drain. Uh, Kyrie Irving has proven that he is not good enough to be the number one option on a championship team. Uh, he's just not. This was his chance. Uh, he followed up a 8 for 22 performance by saying he'd never do it again, and then going 7 for 22, and then uh, he never did it again though. And then yeah. his his unwavering faith and confidence in the Celtics' success led him to go 6 for 21 <laughs> in their elimination game. These and, are very consistent marks. <laughs> And, and one assist in game six. I mean, I, I've been of the mindset that Kyrie Irving is kind of, he threw off the chemistry that we had last year. I think he's bad for our team chemistry. Uh, you know, he's a good player, and I don't want to say, obviously he can be a quality contributor to a championship team because he did it with Cleveland, but he's not good enough to be the leading option, and he's not good enough to, to be the ball-dominating force on a team that wants to make a deep run. Um, I mean, he's just, he couldn't do it in Boston. And uh, the four straight bad games, I think, kind of proves I that. I think it's really interesting, because again, that is the main story, right? I don't think people are looking at this as too much of like a Celtics loss, although they did play pretty poorly, but Kyrie Irving really just had a really bad series. And it's not abnormal to see a star player have a bad game. Again, we just saw Lillard in game seven, shoot three for 17. But Kyrie Irving to do it and just say, you know, it's not going to happen again, and then it happens again, and then it happens again, and then the post-game press conference, he says, 
you know, Kyrie, you know, was there anything you would have done differently? He's like, yeah, I would have taken more shots. <laughs> like, I feel like that mindset is really the mindset of just like, no, I should have like, I should have done, you know, put even more control in a game where I'm not really feeling it. I feel he kind of feels like maybe he's trying to take on too much of this LeBron role where he feels like it has to be him. And he's kind of learned that from LeBron. But again, I just don't feel like he has that kind of leader's mentality. So regardless of whether, you know, how good he is on his best days, uh, and we've seen his best days, I, again, I have to agree with you, I don't really think Kyrie Irving is going to be your leader on a championship team. But that, you know, raises an interesting question, because if he was, if he was supposed to be that guy, and if we think there's a good chance that he leaves his offseason, I mean, then what happens to the Celtics? I think I would be right in saying we expected... Um, Tatum and uh, Jalen Brown to take bigger steps than they have. I think this season they weren't really any better than they were last season, which I think is a little troubling. And then you're going to reach a situation where, you know, this, I mean, you're going to be paying, you know, Al Horford $30 million next season. And then after that, Al Horford's going to be a free agent. And then, you know, it kind of feels like the whole thing is, they still look good now, but could very quickly kind of right. fall apart. I'm still high on the future of the Celtics, so let me just use this as an excuse to kind of trash on Kyrie Irving a little bit more. Sure. Uh, he, after he's made that comment about shoot, he should have taken 30 shots, I can just feel the rest of the locker room cringing to that yeah. comment. That is not what they want. That's not what Damian Lillard did in their game yeah, seven. That, that, that he particularly stuck out to me as like this is this is kind of a cancerous attitude. Right, and what's the result? I mean, beyond Kyrie Irving and beyond this season being a failure, uh, this is hurting the Celtics. You hear Terry Rozier coming out saying like he he doesn't know like the the team culture sucked this year and he doesn't know if he wants to be part of it or he just wants to be part of a team that appreciates him for his contributions. You know why then the Celtics appreciate him for his contributions because Kyrie Irving needs to take 30 shots and it didn't work so I, I, I'm looking forward to the future of the Celtics in terms of yeah also Jalen Brown Jason Tatum uh, took steps back in terms of where we thought they would be um, well they have to they're not dominating the ball like they were last year they're not they're not given their share quote unquote in the offense because everything goes through Kyrie Irving uh, so next year I think not only will he have the opportunity for Gordon Hayward to get back to full strength, because he was not at full strength the entire year this year, uh, maybe a little bit better in the playoffs, but um, not where we would want him to be uh, based on where he was at at Utah. And um, so get back to Gordon Hayward being at full strength, uh, run the offense more through Jason Tatum and, uh, and Jalen Brown. I think maybe they could step up at least back to where they were, uh, start to make forward progress again. And then, obviously, the whole uh, Anthony Davis trade rumors. Uh, I'd love for him to be a member of the Celtics, but, uh, you know, they could take a direction in terms of Anthony Davis would also be a positive step that they could move forward and contend for a title with Anthony Davis on their roster. So, uh, I mean, just, to, uh, just for clarity's sake, Jason Tatum shot 12.5% from three. Uh, Terry Rozier shot 50.8% from three, so I mean, I think it was a team effort around why the Celtics didn't beat the Bucks. But real quick, if Kyrie wasn't on this team, how far would they have gone in this in, in the play, in the playoffs? I think they'd probably sneak past Indiana, but again, that's just because Indiana didn't have Oladipo, so they kind of just had like a walk through the first round, anyways. But I think the the encouraging thing for the Celtics is again. They're in the Eastern Conference. Like, there's not like this like great like end boss like the Warriors or the even you know the Blazers or the Rockets or any of those teams. Uh, you know, even the Thunder I think would probably beat the Celtics. Um, right. I mean, well, nobody's saying that. Uh, just to address the Jason Tatum and uh, four shooting, like nobody's saying that Terry Rozier and Jason Tatum were shooting lights out from three against the Bucks. I, they did. The point is they took step back this year and I think a lot of that has to do with uh, trying to play submissive to Kyrie Irving and fit within that new system and part of it is also Brad Stevens kind of forcing Gordon Hayward back into that lineup I mean that's something that gets talked about a fair amount and I think it's something that deserves criticism I mean these young players are going from being the front of the offense uh, to kind of trying to fight for their role in, in a crowded talented 
team and it uh it, it was bad for the development i think and, and they struggled be because of that you know not kyrie irving wasn't shooting six for 21 and seven for 22 because jason tatum was shooting for three you know shooting poorly from three you know that was his mentality from the start no matter what and uh, i think it really hurt this team uh, where would they be without kyrie irving how far would they have gone into the playoffs i think uh, well, a lot of it depends on. Well, first of all, I know that the Bucks team is better this year than they were last year, but uh, with pretty similar rosters, the Celtics beat the Bucks last year in seven games without Kyrie Irving and without Gordon Hayward. Uh, it depends on Gordon Hayward's pro process. If Gordon, if Brad Stevens did a better job uh, trying to merge Gordon Hayward back in and, and maybe work him in more slowly. Uh, they'd have a better chance of, of doing better against the Bucks. I mean, uh, they would have gone past the Pacers. I, I don't think the end result would have been too different. Uh, you can't lose any worse to the Bucks than they did this series. So, Well, I think that, okay, so, I mean, everybody just spent a lot of time trashing Kyrie Irving. I'm about to make it, I'm about to be going defensive Kyrie, so uh -huh. this is going to be interesting. But I think if Kyrie Irving wasn't on this team, the Boston would be, would have lost to the, the Raptors, the Sixers, and the Bucks, and arguably, I think they would have gotten swept by the Bucks. I think the Bucks were just a better team this year. Uh, Giannis, Giannis had took a great leap forward. Middleton took a great leap forward. Mike Buttonholzer going coming going to the Bucks was absolutely huge for them in terms of giving them a, giving them a correct system to work with. Because I mean, people forget last year, uh, Jason or Jason Kidd was fired midseason. Yeah. Okay, so the Bucks had a lot of coaching turmoil, and they still took the Celtics to seven games, even though, even though every home team won that game. And I would make the argument that the Bucks were a lot closer to win on the Celtics' home floor than the Celtics were to win on the Bucks' home floor that year. And with uh, with respect, like with Kyrie, I think I can make an apt comparison with the Boston Celtics this year to how the Warriors are with Kevin Durant. I think with Kevin Durant not in the lineup, the Warriors play a drastically different style of offense as seen in Game 6 this year. Um, they play a lot more motion, they give Steph and Clay a lot more touches, and it seems to work better for them, right? But they need Kevin Durant in certain moments. When Steph and Clay are having bad games, which can happen, they need somebody who's for sure going to get them points. And yeah, Kyrie had a bad season this year, but that's the role that I think Kyrie plays on the Celtics this year. In fact, I think that if Kyrie was not in the lineup, they would play the same style of offense, a similar style of offense to that of the Warriors, but with less quality talent around them. Like, there's no one on the Celtics, including Kyrie, that can touch Steph in terms of the way he plays, and same with Clay. And I think that, and I think that uh, if the Celtics didn't have Kyrie, they would play the same way, but they'd just be less successful at it because the Warriors have better talent than them. So that's why I think they absolutely need Kyrie to pour in whatever points that he can give. And he did outscore everyone else on the Celtics by 20 points. Kyrie scored 102 points in that series, which was 21 more points than the, than the next guy. I do. I'm really happy you bring up this Warriors comparison because I almost... Yeah, I'm basically going to use that same comparison to kind of make the reverse argument. Because I do think you're, you're right that the Celtics are similar to the Warriors in that you know they have this big star player that kind of leads uh, and then when he's removing him would kind of force other players to kind of step up what I I think when you, what you see with the Warriors is with Kevin Durant they're obviously a better overall team just because you're adding an MVP to the roster but without Kevin Durant I think it arguably makes the rest of their team especially Steph Curry, actually better. And again, I think you have to make this distinction of the whole team is still worse because they don't have Kevin Durant. But when, you're taking, but when you take away that MVP, I think a lot of the times when Kevin Durant's the primary ball handler, Steph Curry gets kind of out of his rhythm because he's just kind of like floating around on corners trying to free himself to get open, and he's kind of reduced to more of just like a pure shooter. I think he kind of needs to have the ball in his hands and kind of you know, do his dribbling and whatever to get him uh, more momentum and kind of work himself back into a rhythm. Why I think the Warriors are still better with Kevin Durant is because Steph and Clay and Draymond Green are kind of they're at their peak, or at least they're or at least maybe for Clay and Draymond Green. You know, I guess 
maybe we don't really know that yet, but at the very least, they're not going to get much better if they're going to get better. But I think when you have a young team like the Celtics, and you have these guys like Tatum and Jalen Brown, I think if you remove Kyrie, they will kind of be forced to kind of take things in their own hands. So while that's like obviously a very drastic thing to do, if you want to see the best Jason Tatum, because I thought I think we thought Jason Tatum would develop into one of the best forwards in the league, I think maybe to get the, reach that full development of Jason Tatum, you might just need to throw the ball in his hands and like see what he can do. The problem with that is, again, it might take a couple years of the Celtics not being like the best team in the world, but that might be best for his development just as a player. Right, maybe. I think... I don't really understand the whole, like, well, first of all, if we're going to, we might as well have gotten swept by the Bucks yeah. because uh, games two through five were not close. None of them. All of them were blowouts starting in the third quarter. Uh, and we didn't, I mean, if we played like, like we did in that series, we wouldn't have beaten Toronto or Philadelphia either, you know? Uh, so I don't think, in terms of without Kyrie Irving, uh, I, we were probably about in the same spot in the East. I don't think you would have swept the Pacers, though. The, the, there were games in Game 3 and Game 4 where the Pacers were up big uh, at the half. I remember uh, Game 3 specifically. And uh, so Kyrie, in part, led those comebacks with, with amazing games and amazing shots. He's a good player, and he's had his moments, but like could have... Could last year's team that beat uh, or that made the conference finals with that team have swept the Pacers? Uh, maybe uh, they were probably talented enough to do it. Um, you know, in, in last year's team, which was uh, praised like heavily just for taking the Cavaliers to games. I mean, the expectations kind of changed too. Uh, so I, part of the reason that we were uh, performed worse and were inconsistent all year, I think, can be attributed to the changing expectations. Uh, but in general, I just think uh, we're, we work much better as a unit without Kyrie Irving because he needs to dominate the ball so much. And uh, if, I think in our future, uh, if we could work someone like Anthony Davis into that, or even just try to develop our young players without Kyrie Irving, and maybe we wouldn't be quite as good, but working towards the development of Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum, we'd be better off long term and our odds of winning a championship uh, would go up without Kyrie Irving on the roster. I think they just got, part of it is they just got really unlucky with Gordon Hayward. I think if you had a healthy Gordon Hayward, they, again, it's tough to go back and say, like, the probably, but they would have had a pretty good chance of winning the East last year, and I think the trajectory on this team is a little different. Um, it's, yeah, it, it, it's kind of difficult to see. Um, again, I think the Celtics will always be a solid playoff team just because... I mean, who else is going to, you know, who else is really going to pass them? I guess what's very funny is that the Nets are suddenly becoming kind of decent yeah. after that whole trade. Uh, and the Celtics finally, the Nets have their own draft picks again moving forward. And now all of a sudden the Nets are the sixth seed. Um, but yeah, it's difficult. I mean, any, before, I guess we're going to finish off with the conference finals predictions. But uh, any, any last thoughts on Boston or anything else so far? Um, I, I think most of the Celtics nation is kind of on board with Kyrie Irving leaving, and uh, I, I just think that's that's where we're at, and that's the team's going to be better off uh, moving in a newer, cleaner direction, and probably better for Kyrie too because uh, he's it hasn't really worked out, and he's he can be a contributor on a championship team, just not here. That'll be a really interesting storyline to follow. <laughs> I think, yeah, and we have all the rumors of, like, you know, the Katie, Kyrie, maybe even Zion Williamson mix squads, but uh, it would be very interesting, especially, uh, you, you, do, you, do you think whichever team gets Zion Williamson will just, like, sway free agents from left and right? Like, Katie will just join Zion somewhere? It would be a factor. Oh, I don't know, it's hard to say. <laughs> free agency, it's, there's so many factors that go yeah, into it. It's, it's very difficult. I think... The Celtics would be absolutely crazy to let go of Kyrie Irving at any point because of how good a player he is. I think that, I think that Kyrie just needs more time with Brad Stevens, and I think Brad Stevens needs to adjust, needs to adjust the system a little bit because Kyrie Irving is a player such that an egalitarian offense doesn't really work because when one person is way better at scoring than anybody else on that team, you have an obligation as a coach to give that player more touches, and I think that. And I think that when uh, I, I'm going back to the Warriors because they do it so well. Because when 
when when K when KD um, is not either going off or when Steph and Clay are having not bad games, they play a very egalitarian system of offense. And Kyrie during the course of the regular season was willing to do that. There was a there was a stretch of ten games in the regular season where Kyrie averaged eleven assists per game. He can do it, and he has done it before. It's just when everyone else on the Celtics has been so inconsistent, he is he needs and he should. He needs to take more shots. He needs to be more aggressive. He needs to be what Kevin Durant is to the Warriors when everybody's not playing well. And I think he was. I think he tried to do that this series, but I don't think anybody played well this series. Partly because the Bucks have an amazing defense and they're a great team. But I think when nobody else on the Celtics is playing good, Kyrie has that obligation to step up, and he tried to his credit. And granted, the shots didn't go in this time around. But he's a great enough player. He's he's really young, and he will get better. He's not at his peak yet, and he and I think the Celtics would be absolutely crazy to get rid of him now. I don't think anyone's going to question Kyrie's talent or his determination. I just think it's, yeah, the Celtics kind of determining what's the best move for them going forward, and the same for Kyrie Irving. It'll be interesting to follow uh, for sure, but again, moving on to the conference finals, the first series we have, we have the number one seed, Golden State. Versus number three seed Portland, who kind of won that sweepstakes to uh, be the team that faced the Warriors. It feels like a lot of teams could have got that. OKC, Denver, Spurs, all the teams in that half had a shot at it. Portland prevailed. These two teams split 2-2 in the regular season. Uh, you know, I think the fun kind of story is the whole Steph Curry versus Seth Curry, but the real story is just the backcourts. Steph and Clay versus Damian Lillard and CJ McCollum with the lingering Kevin Durant injury. Yeah, we, and uh, just to clarify, uh, sorry, we do know now as of today, Kevin Durant is ruled out for Game One and doubtful for Game Two. Yeah. So outside of their backcourt and Curry and Clay Thompson, I mean, this is a team, the Warriors team, that's probably going to be starting Andrew Bogut and Andre Iguodala along with Draymond Green. I, I mean, they're not behind Curry and Thompson. They're vulnerable. They're they're not an elite. Uh, powerhouse roster behind those two play and obviously those are two very good backcourt players that make that team an elite team uh, but if you look at it as a whole it comes down to Curry and Thompson matching up with Damian Lillard and CJ McCollum and uh, they're CJ McCollum and Damian Lillard are very confident in, in their abilities and they have a clean shot to, to knock off this Warriors team and and I give them a real chance uh, I, do, I do definitely think, regardless, especially as for um, if KD stays out even longer than you know two or three games, I think you can say anything what you that you want, but it will come down to just kind of this backcourt matchup, and I do think we have two of the best three backcourts in the league. Uh, interesting to hear, say KD, it's more severe than we think. He will, he won't be evaluated until Thursday, which is the game, which is the day they're game two, uh, but he could be out for another week. Like, say there's no KD at all for this series, and it's just straight up backcourt versus backcourt. What do you think that would look like? Um, I'd lean towards Portland. Uh, I think I, I'd want to just I'd want to roll with Portland, and I think part of the reason uh, I know Steph Curry had an awesome second half of Game Six against the Rockets, but he did not play very well that entire series. How good was Damian Lillard that last series, though? I mean, he's good enough to win. I mean, that's what that's the credit I was giving to Damian Lillard earlier. I mean, scoring 13 points in Game Six, but he made the right decisions to help his team win late in the game. And I have that trust in Damian Lillard that he would continue to do that. He's unselfish enough to to play that way even against the Warriors. And uh, I mean, he's not a good playoffs. I, I think. Um, in terms of the pressure that's going to be, the Warriors are the defending champions, and I know that they've already proven that they're capable of, you know, winning the championship and everything, even without Kevin Durant, because they did it uh, without. I mean, it's basically that same team, right? Except a little bit worse. Uh, Andre Iguodala is not what he was then, and uh, I mean that team was vulnerable. They had the the LeBron team uh, with 
the second best player being Matthew Delavatova. Uh, that team took that Warriors six games. You know, they they're not invincible. Are we really gonna say their second best player was? I guess they. I guess with the injuries. To right. The injuries. I mean, I'm sure it wasn't Matthew Delavatova. But yeah, I got well, he was just playing. I, under, I understand what you're saying. He was the, the scrappy Jim Brett. Right. Well, the point of all this is that yeah. the that Warriors team is vulnerable. Yeah. And this Warriors team that's going against the Trailblazers without Kevin Durant is that team, but worse. Draymond Green has regressed offensively. I do think you're right that this uh, that this Warriors team is vulnerable, and this is probably their bench gets a little worse every season, mm-hmm. and this is probably the most vulnerable they've been. Um, although I do want to credit Iguodala and Draymond Green do specifically feel like they have this playoff switch where they kind of turn it on they get much better uh, Draymond Green we do have to watch his uh, technical fouls for potential suspension always a, always a problem with Draymond Green um, but for me until the Warriors lose I cannot find it in me to pick against the Warriors I think I don't think it changes massively for me depending on when Kevin Durant gets back. Because again, I think the Warriors have shown an ability to be able to win without Kevin Durant, both in this Rockets game, or last two Rockets games, and then also just for the time he's been there, the Warriors do have a pretty ridiculous record even without Kevin Durant. And I do think, it again, it kind of puts an onus on Curry to kind of show off and perform, and I think he does well in that. Um, if you just want to throw a prediction out there, the Warriors have closed out both their first two series on the road, winning in six, and I'll, I'll call it three in a row for Warriors in six. Yeah, uh, that record you're talking about of the Warriors without KD is a uh, 30 and four. So I actually think the Trailblazers have next to zero chance to win this series. I think that Steph and Clay are just better than Damian Lloyd and CJ McCollum straight up. I just, in general, I think Steph and Damian Lillard, I think Steph's just a better version of them, of Damian Lillard. They both still like to shoot the long three. They're both really good at that in the first round. They're both really bad at that in the second round. But I think, I think that overall, Steph Curry will show that he is still a class above Damian Lillard in terms of pure shooting ability and scoring ability. And Clay and CJ McCollum, that's a more interesting comparison because Clay is obviously the better shooter, but CJ McCollum is obviously the better scorer. That's, that's closer, yeah. However, I think the I think the difference between the two lies in the de- lies defense. in the defense. Yeah. I think Clay is a way better defender than either Damian Lillard or nor CJ McCollum, and I think that matters a lot. And I think overall with the Warriors, how are um how are the Trailblazers going to combat the small lineups that they br- that the Warriors consistently bring out there? I don't think there's a way to do that with the way that uh, Nurkic is out. Cantor has been their like third best player, honestly, on the on the team, and I think that Cantor will be largely ineffective given how bad he is on defense and how you might get switched on to Curry or Curry and have that matchup go the way it goes. I think that the Warriors, even without Kevin Durant, or even if Kevin Durant comes back game three, will win this series very comfortably. I'm picking them in five. All right, so Kevin Durant out for the series. If that were the case, uh, I would take Portland. I'll go Portland in six. Uh, if KD comes back in the series, maybe uh, Warriors in seven. But I just want to focus on the, uh, the Blazers being able to beat uh, the Warriors without Kevin Durant because, I, I mean, first of all, Steph Curry is not a great defender. He's going to have to guard either Damian Lillard or CJ McCollum. You know? Will he? He didn't, have to, he, didn't, he didn't have to guard either uh, Harden or Paul in that series. That was Iguodala in play. Okay, so they're gonna try to hide him on defense. I think, they the, and they did think, a pretty good job of it. I think the Blazers are deep enough to exploit that with Rodney Hood. I mean, play Evan Turner hitting two clutch free throws. I mean, the Rockets have the best one-on-one player in, in the game right now. I do and think, he, and, and they couldn't exploit it as well. As well, I do think regardless, I mean, Curry, Curry, about the Curry, will, Curry will get switched on Damian Lillard a lot. I think that's pretty fair. So. Yeah, I mean, I don't understand. Like, <laughs> is that an insult to the Rockets? Maybe for not exploiting that as well. I, I mean, I don't think I don't think that I don't think that matchup is as easy to exploit as a lot of people think. Okay, well, and Curry, I, for the record, he doesn't he he doesn't suck. He's you know he's an average defender. Yeah. Uh, he's just the worst defender in that lineup. He, that is true. Yeah, and it's exploitable. He got in a lot of foul trouble. I mean, that's kind of been a re- recurring theme with Steph Curry, trying to get him in foul trouble. The Blazers, yeah. I mean, the Rockets were effective at that. Maybe the Blazers could try, if not 
uh, getting one, of, which I still think they're going to be able to get Damian Lillard or McCollum on uh, Steph one on one, and even if not, maybe uh, maybe one of their bigger because fo- those are their two guards. Maybe one of their bigger forwards uh, could post them up in that case. You know, it, the the war- you can't switch everything instantly, um, so they could just try to find whoever Curry is guarding and uh, at a minimum get him in foul trouble. Uh, I mean, the Blazers are kind of proven to be a deep-ish team. Zach Collins has played really well. Uh, they play with a lot of heart. And they're not um, scared. Yeah, they're not scared of anything. Uh, this year, their Damian Lillard has kind of proven or shown and talked about that they're ready to, to take the next step, and uh, they're capable of exploiting the, the Warriors when they're down a little bit. So I, uh, without Kevin Durant, I'm going to take Dame time and the Blazers to win in six games. Uh, but, the, you know, depending on uh, – I'm not going to stick to that – Firmly, because depending on when slash if uh, Kevin Durant's able to play, because would, he makes a big difference. I would still be very surprised to see the Blazers win this series, regardless of anything that happens with Kevin Durant. I think, for me, I do not doubt uh, Damian Lillard and CJ McCollum's abilities to go shot for shot with the Splash Brothers. I think they're good enough. Uh, I think what it comes down to, I think the way to beat the Warriors is relatively well known. I think it comes from forcing them into you know, playing good defense, forcing turnovers, and then generating extra possessions off offensive rebounds. Because if you go possession for possession with the Warriors, you're going to lose. So you've got to find ways to create possessions for yourselves and steal possessions away from them. And ultimately, I just think the Warriors, I think it'll be another similar to the Rockets series with a lot of close games, but I think the Warriors will be able to pull it out. That's, fa- that's fair, but the Blazers, ha- speaking of like offensive rebounds, uh, Ennis Cantor is one of the best offensive rebounders in the league, so uh, trying to get an edge in like, any way possible, there's another uh, good one for it's, them. It's, it's possible. Uh, but I think, so we have, you are, Michael, you're contingent, either Warriors in seven or Blazers on six, kind of depending on Kevin Durant. I'm Warriors in six, British Warriors in five. I think we still think Warriors at full strength are better than the Blazers. Uh, so we will switch over to the other matchup. We have the Bucks and the Raptors. The Bucks dropped one game to the Celtics, but otherwise have basically crushed their opponents eight times. They went three and one against Toronto in the regular season, and it you know kind of brings up the question: Milwaukee has felt unstoppable, best record in the league this season. Does Toronto have any chance against the Bucks? Um, I'll start by saying yes. Uh, I'm just gonna. I'll take uh, Toronto in seven. Uh, win game seven in Milwaukee. Uh, Spicy. Yeah, I think Kawhi is that good. Uh, the the baseline reason is gonna be that I trust Kawhi Leonard more than I trust Giannis. Uh, Giannis is not as proven of a, of a playoff player. Uh, even against Boston, I don't. I mean, yeah, he played well, but. Um, that was easy for them, you know. We we already talked about that series, but um, four of the games, the four games that they won, were all blowouts. So I, I'm not gonna give the the kind of crunch time playoff experience that we're still looking for Giannis to show. He hasn't really had the opportunity to prove that yet. Kawhi's been doing it for years. Um, I really good defender. You're looking for. Uh, somebody to try to guard Giannis. I mean, first of all, it's going to be a team effort, but and the Raptors are an excellent defensive team. But who, would, in terms of like one-on-one, uh, who would you rather have that could uh, maybe other than Kevin Durant uh, to to guard Giannis than Kawhi Leonard? Uh, he, year after year, he's been uh, arguably the best defensive player in the league. Uh, his offense has taken tremendous steps forward, dropping 41 in their Game 7 win, plus the buzzer beater. Uh, he's M Finals MVP against LeBron in the Heat for his defense against LeBron. Uh, you know, this is a... And they're a good team. They're a deep team, too. Uh, Kyle Lowry proves kind of uh, with DeMar DeRozan that he wasn't really good enough to be their second best player in a contending team, but he's like their fourth best player now. I mean, Pascal Siakam's taking tremendous steps forward. Uh, Mark Gasol is a pretty good acquisition for he's them. He can, he can do a little bit of everything. He can shoot threes for them, etc. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to like Toronto in, in this one just uh, based off uh, trust in Kawhi uh, and their deep roster oh well I think I'm going to go the other way on this one I think I'm going to go Milwaukee in six I think they will beat Toronto in Toronto 
I just think with the way that Milwaukee has played this season and the way that Mike Budenholzer has been known to coach his teams, I think that they will win. And I actually don't trust Giannis that much either because I think that he will be exposed when, uh, once people realize that he can't shoot properly. It seems like they've been guarding him so tight even though he can't really shoot. But I think the people that they've, the players that Milwaukee has surrounded Giannis with is very important because Eric Bledsoe is an amazing defender. Uh, Nikola Miritich is a great shooter. Chris Middleton has been a, about as great as you'd expect him to be, honestly. He's, he's taken in, in tremendous leaps forward. He made his first, first all-star team this year. Um, <clears throat> the Bucks over the regular season were top five in offense and defense. I think that matters a lot because that shows that they have a willingness to commit to the defensive end of the floor and the offensive end of the floor. And I think... I think you've been saying, you said that Kawhi Leonard is arguably the best defender this year. I would actually go Giannis as the best defender in the NBA right now. Uh, his on-ball defense and rim protection has been nothing sort of nothing short of fantastic this series, or uh, this playoffs in general. Uh, so I will go yeah, uh, Milwaukee in the six games. And I will even take it a step further, and maybe this ends up sounding disrespectful, but I'm going to go Milwaukee in five. I do think Milwaukee has, again, just been dominant all season long. Um, and I expect them to kind of continue just storming their way through the Eastern Conference. I will say, what worries me about Toronto is their production outside of Kawhi Leonard. Because, A, I'm kind of, you know, I was, I was higher on the Raptors before the Sixers season series than I am after the Sixers series. I think the Sixers team was dysfunctional, especially late in games, and I think they gave the Raptors more trouble uh, than I would have liked to have seen. Uh, and again, in this Game 7, you have Kawhi Leonard. Again, he played well at the end and he hit the game winner, but he ended up taking 39 shots. And in that game, uh, Pascal Siakam kind of disappeared for most of that game. Uh, I'm just kind of worried. Again, we said they only played seven guys. I'm worried about their bench depth compared to Milwaukee. Again, I'm not going to doubt Kawhi, Kawhi Leonard's ability to perform. But when it comes to guys outside of Kawhi Leonard, I think for me, probably one of the most important players in this series is going to be Kawhi, or is, uh, is going to be uh, Kyle Lowry, because we were able to see him actually have a really big impact on that game seven. He hit a couple threes. He drew some charges. He can be a very good defensive player, and he also. At one point, he grabbed like three offensive rebounds in a span of like a couple minutes, doing a lot of the smaller things. So I think it's going to have to be a full team effort, and they're going to have to get a lot of production from a lot of guys that, you know, a lot of guys that are going to basically going to need to really step up for them to have much of a chance. You know, I agree that uh, Toronto struggled a little bit more than they should have against the dysfunctional Philadelphia team. Uh, but looking at, you're talking about looking at what, who can uh, produce behind Kawhi Leonard. Uh, I'm kind of more on the lines of thinking who's going to produce behind Giannis. I, I think there's going to be a lot of pressure on uh, players like Brooke Lopez and Nikola Mirotic uh, to, to hit shots when they're not really accustomed to that type of pressure throughout their careers. And um, I'm not sure, they couldn't really, I mean, they have their moments, but like Brooke Lopez especially, couldn't really do it against Boston. And, and again, that was a much more lopsided series, but against Toronto, they're, they might need that a little bit more than they have so far. And combine that with the increased pressure on Giannis and the more attention they're going to be, be able to give him on defense because Kawhi is so good. And um, I just... I'd take uh, Toronto's supporting cast over that of Milwaukee, even though Budenholzer's done a great job uh, implementing that system in Milwaukee. I just I trust the playmaking of, say, Kyle Lowry. Maybe um, Giannis is an excellent defender too, but let's say he uh, you know shuts down Kawhi in the corner. I'd be able to trust Kyle Lowry to create his own shot or, or Marc Gasol to, to hit a open three or Pascal Siakam to to drive and, and hit layups more than I'd trust you know uh Brick, Brooke Lopez or, or Nicole Miritich and, and uh Chris Middleton's had his moments and he was an all-star this year but uh that's kind of um the I, I more than that uh, I think they're going to need a little bit more than that to beat the Raptors and I'm not sure they'll be able to get it I do think you're right when you say that this is going to be a very star focused game because I feel like Again, the Raptors and the Bucks, you know, neither one of these teams has any 
really well-known kind of star players outside of Giannis and Kawhi. And I guess there's been a lot of love for Siakam this season as kind of, and he will win most improved player in the league, no questions asked, I think. Um, but overall, I think the Bucks are really just, I, this, so far in this playoffs, they've just been kind of playing out of their minds. They look like the most dominant team in the playoffs by a long shot, and I kind of expect them to keep up that moment. And they only had Malcolm Brogdon for one of those Celtics games, so I think the addition of him will be huge. Uh, to be to be clear, I don't I don't think this like the reason I'm picking the Bucks is not really because of the deficiencies with Toronto. I think it's just because of how good the Bucks have been this season. Like they've just played a very consistent style of defense, consistent style of offense that seemed to work, and it's all centric around how well Giannis has been able to pass the ball out. I think whenever he makes his drive, the entire defense has to collapse on him, and that leaves four decent shooters out on the perimeter for him to pass to. I think. I think the way that Milwaukee plays is just better than the way that Toronto plays, and I therefore I'm going Milwaukee. I think that's all. Take that. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So there you have it. Just to give the final conference finals recaps, we're gonna give Kevin Durant the benefit of the doubt, and so for that series we will have Rich Warriors in five, me Warriors in six, Michael Warriors in seven. And then on the flip side with Milwaukee and Toronto, the top two seeds in the East, I'm going Bucks in five, Rish Bucks in six, Michael Raptors in seven games. Those will be our predictions. Sounds good to everybody? Great. Yep. Sounds great. For the, for the record, I think that even the Warriors without Kevin Durant would also win in five. There you go. Pretty, pretty, pretty confident in the, on the Warriors, are, uh, Rish and I. Michael's not quite as convinced, but we will... See over the next couple weeks who is right, who is wrong. Um, real, real quick, uh, NBA Finals champions predictions. Sure. Uh, I want to take the Toronto Raptors even over the Warriors with Kevin Durant. Not only are they going to beat the Bucks, but yeah. they beat the Kevin Durant yeah. well, and maybe DeMarcus Cousins Warriors. Yeah, well, uh, he, 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 he also thinks that the Blazers will beat the Warriors, so he, he, well, Raptors and the Blazers. On, potentially. Pretty, Raptors depending on the extent of Durant's injury. Yeah. But, uh, assume the Warriors are going to be in there. Uh, I'll take... I'll take Toronto. Uh, let's go six games. Uh, unseat the defending champions. Kawhi will now be Finals MVP because of his performance against Kevin Durant and LeBron James, and take his throne as best player in the NBA. And I will continue. Okay. <laughs> I will continue my kind of philosophy of until someone beats the Warriors, I'm going to take the Warriors. I think the Bucks are the biggest challenge that has been placed in front of the Warriors in the Kevin Durant Warriors era. Um, but I will give Warriors a slight edge. I'll say Warriors in seven. Yeah, I think the Warriors are going to win the title. Uh, if the Warriors play the Bucks, then it'll be a little tighter, I think, than the Raptors. So I'll go Warriors in six if they play the Bucks. If they play the Raptors, Warriors in five. I think the Warriors are just way too good on all aspects. I just think they're the best team ever. So. I, I, I agree with that. I think I'd say against the Raptors, Warriors in five as well. Yeah. Uh, sorry, Michael. <laughs> All right, so those are our NBA Finals predictions. I want to thank both you guys for joining me on the podcast. It's been a lot of fun doing this preview with you. And you've heard our predictions, and we will see in due time whether those turn out true or not. Uh, but once again, this has been Connor Grohl here with Michael and Rich for the Top Level Sports Podcast, breaking down everything going on in the NBA Conference Finals and the rest of the NBA playoffs. You can follow me on toplevelsports.net and at Top Level Sports on Twitter and here on the YouTube channel as well. And until next time, see ya and have fun watching these NBA Conference Finals.